I'd like to tell you a bit about the world warming and how we know the world has warmed and, and how we know the climate itself has changed over the course of the past maybe 150 years or so. And so the, the world has warmed by about a degree on average since the pre-industrial period, and the pre-industrial period being, oh, sort of the 1600s maybe, heading through to, uh, or there's an official definition which is 1850 to 1900. But, but nonetheless, we, we only really have good information from direct measurements from sort of that 1850s going back, going forwards through to today. And those very first measurements were taken with thermometers. Right? In fact, clearly any measurement of temperature is taken with a kind of thermometer uh, because that's what a thermometer is. But really, I mean sort of instrumental thermometers, mercury thermometers uh, often. And, and the longest record we have is actually based in, in central England. And so it's sort of some notional triangle that contains Oxford and London and, and bits of Gloucester. And that's where people, interested amateurs, were, had their little thermometer and they were daily going out and reading the weather every day. And, and we have enough to, to be able to say how cold it was at a monthly resolution back to about the 1660s, uh, which is really when these sort of instruments were really being invented. Uh, and then there's enough accurate readings to know the temperature of this sort of amorphous central England area uh, on a daily basis going back to the 1770s. And, and I think those are the longest instrumental records. Right, we've got records of other things that uh, sort of recordings that are clearly associated with, with climate and weather. So sort of when when cherry trees blossom. There's a lovely record of that from Japan that goes back to the 800s, I think. And, and so we have stuff that clearly tells you about climate, but actually direct measurements of climate only go back to the 1660s and only really in this small portion of central England. Uh, and then you start getting more and more thermometers coming online much uh, sort of as you get through the scientific revolution associated with the industrial revolution. And, and then once you get to about the 1850s, we start having enough measurements to at least have a guess at what the global temperature is. And, the, and these thermometers come from an associate, sort of as a, a rather technical blend of uh, measurements that are taken from the air in a sort of standard weather, it's called a Stevenson screen, a box about 1.8 metres high that you can look in and, and measure the temperature there. Or if you're on a ship, you, it's taken from the ocean surface and so it's a sea surface. And, and although the temperatures are different between the two, the anomalous temperatures, so a warm day is going to be warm at the surface of the ocean and warm at the, in the atmosphere, even though the temperatures themselves might be slightly offset. Uh, and and so, sort of, we've we've got these records going back, and people have done really diligent work digging out uh, all of these records, and and now digitising them, and hum, and and there's a process referred to as homogenisation, where you you know that sort of the instruments are changing slightly. And the example that's close to us here in London is uh, the weather station is, for London, the main weather station is in Kew Gardens, which is right on the edge of London in a wonderful arboretum. Uh, but, well, it was on the edge of London when it was set up. It was right at the outskirts of London. But London has expanded and, and it's still in an arboretum. So it's still trees directly around it, but clearly there's a lot more London in the area. And that means that there's an influence of the urban heat island that can infect these temperature readings. And so we need to know how to get rid of those. And so this process of homogenization is, is doing, I suppose, you, 
if it was just with a computer, you would refer to it as machine learning, but it's just it's not often not with a computer, but it's, it's looking at these data time series and picking out errors in them, in the raw data, and, and coping with problems with them. And I gave the example of Kew Gardens, but that's probably not even the best example. The one I've always been most amazed about is in, after the Second World War, people were recording the surface of the ocean. And, what, and the way you record the surface of the ocean, the temperature of the surface of the ocean, is you throw a bucket over the side and you pull the bucket up and you stick your thermometer in it and you measure the water. And that's fairly standard and that's always the way it's been done until maybe 30 years ago, uh, when more sophisticated techniques were used to do it automatically. But after this, during and after the Second World War, we stopped using wooden buckets and we started using aluminium buckets or metal buckets. And as you pull a metal bucket up, it loses more heat. And so there's actually been really very diligent studies of just constantly throwing buckets over the side and a, a wooden bucket and a metal bucket and pulling them both up out and working out precisely what sort of bias that might introduce into the global record and then working out when different ships and different navies changed their what kind of bucket they were using and bringing that into and bringing even that very technical detail into it because I suppose I said how the world's warmed and the world's warmed by about a degree but over the course of a day the well today the the weather has warmed up over by 10 degrees over the course of just that day and so there is an obvious warming of the climate but it's quite small compared to the noise and you need to be really careful about how you treat the noise to remove it and and so from the and so that sort of accurate measurement through weather observing is still continuing uh, the the peak of the amount of weather stations was about the 1980s and since then we've got other ways of measuring weather and so we scaled back on that and those other ways of measuring weather really uh, are either more automated or more likely the other major source is coming from satellites. And so in the 1950s, not only did you have the space race where we were sending things up into space and people realised quite quickly that once you send something up into space, you don't have to look at space, you can turn around and look at the Earth and see what's going on in the Earth. And you can do some quite snazzy measurements from that. And so the satellite era starts from the 1970s. But simultaneously along with that space race comes a real push forwards in computing. And with that push forwards in computing comes the birth of numerical weather prediction. Pre prior to that, the way you would do a weather forecast would be that you would record all of the observations, you would get them telephoned or telegraphed in to where you're making, to your weather forecasters, and they would either then look through some charts or normally have some mental filing system and think, OK, well, this looks like what happened on the 7th of May 40 years ago, so it's most likely going to progress that way, and then with some expert judgment going into it. But from the 50s onwards, you really start seeing the birth of numerical weather forecasting and, and the real power of computers. And one of the wonderful things about the power of computers is they're able to ingest an awful lot more information. And so that information comes in through a process called data assimilation. And so the satellite will talk directly to the weather forecasting module. And, and what you need to do is you need to account for the fact that the satellite information might be in error and you need to know when it came in. And so there's a very sophisticated set of mathematical algorithms that, uh, that deal with this, and that's called a, a data assimilation process. And really what that's doing is you're taking your model forecast and then you're nudging it through the observations towards your best guess of the, the atmospheric state at this very instance. 
And once, because when you want to do a forecast moving forwards, you need to know what the weather is now. That's a key thing. And so you get this sort of data assimilation going into this to provide an analysis of now uh, and give you analysis of your best guess of the weather forecast. And that same machinery has now been applied looking backwards. And the earliest of the reanalyses goes back to about 1870, I think, where clearly there's not as much data that's being ingested in there. So there's more of the model and it's less constrained by the data just because there's not as much data. But now through, uh, through sort of we're seeing homogenous data sets of not just the surface and say the surface warming, but of the whole atmosphere and you're using a, a physically based weather forecasting model to make the guesses in between rather than say some sort of interpolation scheme. And there's big efforts like uh, over at Reading, there's, a pro there's a, an effort called Weather Rescue where they're trying to get as many old forecasts through volunteers to be fed into these, uh, into these reanalyses of what the climate system is. And so I hope that, that, that that's described a little bit about how we're sort of, I suppose, taking the temperature of the weather, uh, of the climate, and how we know it, and, and the amount of effort we need to put in to be able to do it with the accuracy, to be able to detect these climate changes. But on one level, I, and we're doing this, and I can't help but feel that that is a bit like a doctor working out how, it, how much, how ill its patient is getting. And, and just watching, that process of just watching the world get warmer and warmer is, is charting its demise. And, and, and so what is quite important is then tying that more detailed knowledge of how the world is changing and has changed into justifying action moving forwards so that you don't just keep watching it warm up and up and up and up and up and keep going. And then actually we, we then start mitigating against climate change and reducing our emissions and getting it to level off. And then hopefully we can start, we can start following the temperature as it levels off as well, rather than just watching it go up.